All right. So, um, like I said, we're going to cover um, four different topics. First, Generation Z um, and what does that entail? Second, the changing demographics of our incoming college students. Uh, third, challenges for some of these students. And then last, the impact on fraternities. And then at the end, we're going to take some time to brainstorm ways that we can better recruit now that we know a little bit more about the class of 2022. So uh, you guys have probably heard the term Generation Z thrown around a lot. Uh, these are individuals who were born um, in the mid-1990s, um, there are a ton of different opinions of what the exact date um, that you have to be born after to be considered Generation Z. Um, but the, the, term, the year that I usually use is 1996 and on. So if you're born between 1996 to today, you would be considered Generation Z. Um, it's important to recognize um, the changes in generations because although they are broad generalizations, um, it, Generation Z it may have a lot of um, affinity or they may identify with a lot of attributes that are considered uh, millennial, but being able to make these broad generalizations generally makes it easier to understand um, how people's experiences have shifted over time. Uh, so when we think of Generation Z, if they were born in the mid-1990s, that means that they were still kids and um, very young children um, when 9-11 happened. And so if you think of their experiences, the things that have shaped their mind frame, they've lived in the, the post 9-11 world, and that's pretty much all they've ever known. Uh, that's why one of the nicknames of this generation also gets is the homeland generation. Um, they've grown up knowing that the world's not safe, um, where their parents um, may have been able to walk down the street to go hang out with friends, um, Generation Z, a lot of times they haven't had that opportunity because the world's always been unsafe. It's always been a stranger danger. Um, this generation has also grown up with technology, specifically the iPhone technology. Um, that's not something that um, older uh, generations have had. Um, technology was being invented as they were growing up. For our Generation Z, they've pretty much had it since day one. And so um, they're significantly more tech savvy than. Um, previous generations and utilize technology for their own benefit a lot more. Um, one of the things that I think is really interesting about this generation is how they self-identify. And so, like I said, there's been a ton of research on Generation Z. One of the, the interesting things is that they, in surveys done of these individuals, they self-identify as being loyal, compassionate, thoughtful, open-minded, responsible, and determined. Uh, this is really in stark contrast to how they view their peers. Um, instead of seeing their peers, so their friend groups around them as being these things, a lot of times they see them as competitive or um, shallow or um, self-centered. And so that's a stark contrast, how they view themselves versus how they're viewing their friends. Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with how we as society have dictated um, the way that they should be. And so, I mean, we've all seen all of the memes about kids these days. Um, I think every generation um, loves to hate on the next generation. And so being aware that um, these, this is how um, our incoming freshmen are viewing themselves and also how they view others. It plays a critical part in um, why they join fraternities and even more importantly, why they stay in fraternities. So the demographics are changing for these, um, for our incoming students. We have fewer high school graduates than in previous years. So the number of individuals who are graduating high school is declining, which obviously means the number of individuals who are going to college is declining. We're seeing this significantly in the Northeast and Midwest. Um, and if you think about it, where are the majority of our Pi Lambda Phi chapters? The Northeast and the Midwest. And so it's interesting that these areas have a declining number of high school graduates. Um, the South is growing very slowly. Um, and then the West Coast is growing exponentially. Um, they're seeing actually more high school graduates 
than um, in years past, but that's offset significantly by the decline in the Northeast and Midwest. Uh, the reason behind this is the jobs are changing. Uh, where jobs are, people will follow. And so because there are fewer jobs available in the Northeast and the Midwest, people are moving to areas like California where there is a lot more potential um, to get jobs and to be able to afford to go to college. Um, you look at some of the um, more impoverished states, and of course they're gonna have less people going to college because they're not able to afford it. This is really important for us to be aware of because as we have fewer people going to high school or going to college from high school, that means our potential new member PNM pool is shrinking. And so it's going to be harder for us to uh, recruit as these demographics are changing. One of the other key pieces is that race and ethnicity demographics are also changing. Um, from this year compared to years past, we have 50% more Hispanic graduates and 30% more Asian Pacific Islander high school graduates. If you think about it, um, again, like I just said, the West Coast tends to be the area where we have more high school graduates coming from, and that tends to be an area where we have more Hispanic and Asian Pacific Islander um, identifying individuals living. And so as such, they, more of them are graduating high school, more of them are coming to college. We have about 6% less black non-Hispanic graduates and 14% less white high school graduates. It's really important to note here that um, one of the reasons why you'll see some of this stark decline is because um, our demographics as a nation are changing. Um, you have more individuals who identify as multiple races um, or have a, um, are considered multicultural or um, biracial or multiracial. And so because of that, we're seeing less people who would identify as um, just black or just white. Um, the check boxes are changing. And so as such, our race and ethnicity demographics are changing. It's important to be aware of that because people bring cultural, um, I don't wanna say baggage, they bring um, different experiences based on the cultures that they come from. And as such, we have to be able to recruit towards their experiences. Um, if we are very narrow-minded in our recruiting and only look for people who look a specific way to join our chapter, we're alienating a huge population. Um, and that's not going to, that doesn't help us grow our membership when you alienate people's identities. It's also really important to note that one in 10 incoming college students have at least one parent born outside the US. And so we have a lot of people who their um, English isn't the first language spoken at home. We have individuals who are um, here in the US without a family support. Um, they may have parents in other countries or um, they may be an international student who is here for um, the American experience but doesn't have a lot of the access to what we would consider traditional American college student um, amenities, one of such being joining a fraternity. And so we've gotta be aware of this as we start to recruit students, knowing that they may not have mom and dad um, down the road. They may have mom and dad across the country or in a different country. They may not be going home for holidays, which impacts how they feel um, they belong on a campus, um, how they feel supported on a campus, if they feel isolated. Knowing that this is our demographic is really important and it helps us just helps us shift how we approach these students in recruitment. And then finally, um, only one third of undergraduates coming into college are first generation, which means they didn't have any other family members, um, parents or grandparents who have gone to college. I myself am a first generation student. Um, my grandparents nor my parents went to college and I'm the oldest child, so I was the first one to go. Um, it's important to note that only 27% of that one third, so 27% of first generation students earn their degree in four years. That's compared to 42% of students who um, are continuing generation or their parents or grandparents went to college. 42% of them are graduating in four years. So only 27% of first gen are earning a degree in four years. And so we see a lot of issues with people um, maintaining all four years and graduating. And so like dropping out early or um, taking more than four years to graduate. 
Why is that important for us? If we are looking at recruiting freshmen, they may be there for five years. They may be there for six years. How does their experience with us impact that? After four years, are they still going to want to be part of our organization? Are they still going to feel connected? On the other side, if only 27% of them are earning a degree um, in four years, that means a lot of them are dropping out. That impacts our membership. We put a lot of energy into recruiting these young men, and then they don't persist, they don't stay, they don't graduate. And so that's when we get into having to expel these members or um, losing um, large percentages of our rosters and ending up with a lot of young officers because we've lost the majority of our upperclassmen. So being aware of that and making sure that we are focusing on supporting these men and giving them opportunities to continue their experience and feel really connected to the fraternity is so important. And being able to sell that to a potential new member and let them know, hey, you know what? We have an opportunity for you to be a leader in our chapter, um, not just as a sophomore, junior, senior, but if you take that victory lap and you're here for a fifth year, these are other ways you can be involved in our fraternity. That is such a great way to be able to sell um, fraternity membership to these young men. So I've gone over some of the demographics. Um, there's something really important that really stood out to me as I was doing some of this research. The incoming freshman class is the most diverse we've ever had. Um, you saw 50% more Hispanic graduates, 30% more Asian Pacific Islander. The demographics are changing. However, with this incoming class of freshmen, with our Generation Z, the word diversity has lost its meaning. It's almost like it is the just say no of this generation. Um, for some of us, just say no was the big thing that we grew up with. Just say no to drugs, just say no. And it became so redundant and so overused that it became a joke. Um, just say no, ha ha, but not really. Um, and diversity has almost kind of lost, uh, has fallen into that same trap where we say, oh, we have diversity, but it's so shallow and it means nothing to these young men. And so instead of saying, you know, we're the most diverse fraternity on campus, which is something that Pilot and Defy chapters, because we have such an amazing creed and such a great history, usually we are the most diverse group on campus. But if we can use different language in order to connect to these men, it has a bigger impact. So instead of saying we have the most diverse chapter on campus, we have a chapter that has more intersectionality or that um, our brothers bring uh, their own cultural experiences to our fraternity and it's what makes our fraternity great. Um, and then, you know, on the other side, we're very lucky because we have our creed. Talking about bias and prejudice, being able to discuss these things with young men is so much more impactful than just saying, oh, we're a diverse group. Um, and then beyond that, being able to communicate layers of um, cultural difference. So we aren't just a group that everyone has different skin colors. We're a group that people come from different socioeconomic status or uh, statuses or classes. People who come from different countries, different sexualities, um, different experiences and being able to talk about that and not just using this buzzword, buzzword diverse or diversity can mean so much for a young man who's looking for that experience that's a little bit different and that's not the stereotypical fraternity experience. This brings me into my next um, topic you know, we just talked about how this incoming class views diversity difference. They're also viewing, they're also experiencing a lot of challenges that other um, individuals before them may not have experienced. In doing a study, um, the um, Research Center for the American College Freshmen located at the University of South Carolina, um, they did a survey of um, first year college students and discovered that 71% are experiencing homesickness, 57% feel isolated from campus life, and 53% are worried about their physical or mental health. These are just some of the, the key things. Um, that there was a ton of other information that came from this survey. But if you think about it, this is the one place that we would be able to actually help resolve some of these challenges. Um, we always say that when you join a fraternity, you're joining a family. 
Um, a lot of our chapters have houses that they can physically go to. And so we are a direct solution for those experiencing homesickness to have a family on campus, to have that brotherhood, and to have a place that they feel like they can be themselves. Um, fraternity off life often uh, connects students through to campus life as a whole, whether it's through doing homecoming or service events or socials, we provide a connection to the campus. Um, and then beyond that, um, having that support group that can help you, whether it's being your workout buddy or um, being someone to talk to or that can point you towards the resources that you may need on campus, we can be a direct solution to a lot of the challenges that first year students face. And so if we can sell that to young men, it is a, a huge turning point in the, our ability to, to really um, connect to their needs and um, make them feel better about joining a fraternity. Uh, the second challenge that first year students are facing, and we are all aware of this, is finances. It's expensive to go to college. Uh, the student loan crisis or student debt crisis is insane. It's in the trillions. Um, and, you know, I'm someone who I just finished off paying my student loans six years after I graduated from my undergrad. Um, with that, we have to be aware of the fact that students are, have to be more financially conscious or fiscally aware. Um, it is expensive to join a fraternity. We all know that. It is a, a luxury of sorts. And so being aware that we have to um, have a good return on investment so that um, they see the benefits of paying this money to join a fraternity. It's also really important to note that um, working on campus has now become part of the, the student identity, the student experience. Um, the majority of college students are working some sort of job. Most of the time it is on campus. Um, and being aware uh, that when we say being a part of a fraternity is a 10 hour a week commitment, they may already be committed to working on campus. And so that may take precedence over joining a fraternity. Some of the other additional challenges for first year students they may be caring for family members. Um, now more than ever, we see individuals who have to take care of their parents or grandparents, um, not just um, in the, the sense of going home and making sure that dinner is made for them or providing additional um, support that way, but financially supporting parents um, and grandparents. After the Great Recession, uh, a lot of people lost their jobs and it became a family, um, a family project to raise the money to be able to um, support um, the entire family. It wasn't just one bread, um, one breadwinner. Um, a lot of people had to go to work and that includes their children. So being aware that when we say that there's a commitment for time or money, there may be alternative things that take precedence and we have to be aware of that when um, providing um, reasons to why to join a fraternity. Um, and then finally, the job market is super competitive, and so a lot of students are taking internships or work study. And so being able to articulate um, the benefits of joining fraternity as it relates to internships or work study uh, is really key. If we can sell the fact that joining fraternity um, provides you an opportunity to network, which can help you get internships or work study, that's a huge selling point for us. But we don't often talk about that. Um, because we focused so wholly on just one aspect of the college um, experience and not all of um, the facets that may go into why a student would want, want to be a part of one of our organizations. So what does all of this mean for us? Um, we are now seeing um, some shifts in fraternity life. Um, no longer is it no longer are people looking for the animal house experience. 95% of men who join fraternities join for belonging. That's huge, this idea of being a part of something bigger than yourself. Um, and what we're seeing is that the men who don't find that, who don't experience that belonging, or whatever reason that they decide to join, the second highest reason why men join fraternities is for personal development. But if they're not getting that out of the fraternity, within one to three months, they are more likely to leave. And so we have about one to three months to really sell them 
on why should you um, be a part of this fraternity? Why should you stay a part of this fraternity? If you think about it, what's the first thing a young man does when he joins a fraternity? He has new member education. And so that is our time to really solidify this is why you should join and this is why you should stay. Um, and hitting those points, talking about belonging, showing them what it means to belong to an organization, um, and then providing them development, whether it's professional or personal development, giving them those experiences from day one, and then being able to articulate that to the next class. So when you're recruiting the next group, being able to have experiences, concrete evidence to show this is what it means to be a part of our organization, and this is what you will get out of it. With these uh, changing demographics, we are seeing two other things that I want to point out. We have a higher number of never joiners. Um, this is generational changes, it's financial changes, it's everything kind of culminating into one. Um, more men are saying, you know what, I'm not interested, this isn't for me. And so they have written us off before we even have a chance to, to talk about our experiences, talk about paternity. And so we have to be really, really careful on how we are making that initial um, first impression. And so for a lot of these never joiners, if we're handing them a sheet of paper that has a ton of text for them to read, they don't care. Why should they put any time and energy into that, into reading that? Because they know they're never joining. Um, being able to show them pictures or to show them an experience, invite them to come hang out with us or to go do something like a service project or a professional development um, opportunity that changes the game for them because then they're able to see this is what um this is what my return on investment can be this is what i can get out of it and it can change them from a never joiner to a joiner and being a new member for us the second thing that is really interesting with this new demographic is about 70 percent of men who participate in formal recruitment will join upon the end of the recruitment period 70 percent of men who are participating in formal recruitment will actually join that says nothing about how many men will actually like become initiated or anything like that. That's different information. Um, and they're still doing research to figure that out. For us, that is super important because that means 30% of men who are going through formal recruitment don't find a place. And with Pine Defy, because we are such a unique fraternity, a lot of those men who would normally not fit in in other groups, they can find their home in Pine Lamb Defy. And so being aware that if we rely solely on the formal recruitment period, we could be missing out on a huge chunk of really potentially great brothers. And so utilizing that 365 recruitment, making friends and being aware that never joiners can become joiners is so critical for us as we move forward. Um, the, the landscape is changing. Less men are going to college means less um, men are going to be joining our fraternities. We have to be able to change our approach to recruitment in order to better um, recruit and to keep people in our fraternities. One of the questions that we always like ask new members or new um, or initiated brothers is, why did you join? What did you want to be a part of? We very rarely, rarely ask, why did you stay? And I think if we start asking ourselves, why did you stay? and start presenting that information to our, our new members so that they can see like, this is actionable. These, this is what I can get out of this experience. They'll be much more likely to join us than if we keep just saying, well, it's a great experience or, you know, you'll make a lot of friends. If we're able to, to articulate and with meaning and with purpose, talk about the true like meaning of brotherhood and um, talk specifically about the experiences that, that we have had that prove that we have brotherhood or that we have personal development, that changes the game um, entirely. And so I know I just threw a lot of information at you guys. I now want to kind of open it up to you guys. Um, what are some of your thoughts on some of this information and how are you guys already using or planning to use uh, some of this information to um, better your recruitment going forward. And I'm going to unmute you guys. So any thoughts on um, the incoming generation and, or incoming, incoming class of 2022 and how you're going to use this information to recruit? 
Yeah, um, I, I really like the point uh, when you started, when you were talking about how we get across the message of being a diverse fraternity, because I think it's, it's one of the most important things about being a PILAM, but at the same time, every single fraternity can say that because they know that that word means something. So I think what our chapter has done well is to kind of break that down and say, okay, what does being a diverse fraternity actually mean? It means that we're not just guys who played sports in high school and like have rich parents and come to school and join a fraternity. It means that we've got musicians, athletes, you know, people who like outdoors, stuff like that. Um, and so I think that's really crucial to, to keep pushing to some of these potentials. Absolutely. That's so key. Like diversity is so much more than this blanket term. Um, and I think it's really cool for your chapter to be able to, to talk about that. Exactly. Any other thoughts? How are you going to use this? Um, I like, I also like the point, uh, where we start to emphasize more of why you stayed versus why you joined. Uh, I think when you start to push uh, those type of things, you start to differentiate yourself from other fraternities. So when guys are rushing around different places, they really start to hear the same things and the same questions. So I think that would be a pretty uh, important differentiator something to talk about and something that changes their mindset a little bit because they go in one day. they already kind of know why they join a fraternity otherwise they they don't really show up to a rush process but if they can understand why they sh why they would be able to stay and enjoy the whole entire process of being a fraternity for four years that would be really important absolutely i think like if you can go into your first chapter meeting and hand out uh, note cards and say like Everyone write down why you stayed in this fraternity, not why you joined, but why you have stayed even like through the, the really rough times and the good times, the bad times and the ugly times. Like, why did you stay? Yeah. Collect all of that and then be able to like actually talk about that with P&Ms. Yeah. Total game changer. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. I don't know. Well, Thank you guys so much for taking time out of your day to come on to this webinar. I hope that you got something out of it. I hope that you enjoyed it. Um, we do have three more webinars. Um, I think I saw that you guys were signed up for some of them. Um, you will get um, emails the day of those um, calls in order to get the information, the login information for those. It will not be the same as the login information for this one. Um, and if you guys have any additional thoughts, questions, or want to chat more, please feel free to reach out to me. I love this stuff. I have a lot of data. Um, this data has come from, like I said, the um, Research Center on the American College Freshman, as well as information from Fired Up Technology, um, or Technify Technology. Um, they pull the information from Chapter Builder and um, their other software that they use to um, their recruitment software. And so that's where all of this information is coming from. And so. Uh, lots of really cool data. There's more of it. I do have access to more if you want to learn. Um, and yeah, I hope you can use it to have a really amazing recruitment. So are these, uh, since you recorded it, are these going to be available somewhere for us? Absolutely. So we have a YouTube channel. Uh, this video will be uploaded to that channel. Um, okay. And I'm working on figuring out how to have the video uploaded to Chapter Spot. I have not figured out how to do that yet, but as soon as I do, I will let you guys know. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great night, guys. You too.